Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on what ISCB is now offering for pupils in year seven and eight, including the new CE specifications and the IPQ. Uh, having not been able to attend any conferences this year, we weren't able to hold our own conference. It is a real pleasure to be engaging with several hundred teachers who signed up for these sessions. We hope that you find this introductory session helpful and we look forward to seeing you at other events in the coming months. Please tell us what you think of this session so we can build your feedback in as we plan other events uh, for further professional development. For me personally, it's really exciting uh, to see the launch of these specifications. When I became ISCB chair in October 2018, I committed to a full consultation uh, on the future of CE and I was delighted by the number of teachers from senior and prep schools who wanted to contribute. In what seems now like the far off pre-pandemic days, it would have been unheard of for such a consultation process to take place without meeting face to face. And so we held a series of meetings to discuss CE as a whole and individual subjects. And two key elements underpinned discussions. First, we wanted to address the view that CE was in some way outmoded and focus too much on imparting a huge body of knowledge. Second, we wanted to address the perception that it lent itself to rote teaching. This drew us into focusing squarely on what CE is for. So while retaining a function as an entrance examination, its value lies in providing an opportunity for prep schools to acknowledge what pupils have achieved in year seven and eight, and allowing senior schools to know what pupils arriving at the beginning of year nine know and understand and can do. And as such, it can provide the backdrop for exciting teaching and fulfilling learning. To ensure this, we began to focus on what we initially called learner profiles. Uh, what sort of learners would pupils who had followed the CE specifications actually be? We were perhaps a bit idealistic about this, and at times rather wordy, um, but a clear consensus emerged. And this showed us what so many teachers see as the value of CE. Over time, these have been refined and condensed, but those of you who were involved in the consultation will recognise the things that we talked about, especially the shorthand of less is more, uh, less focus on what pupils know and more on what they can do with what they know. It's not about knowledge versus skills, but how acquiring knowledge enables the development of skills. And so now we have on the front of all of the specifications a clear indication of what CE is all about. First of all, CE equips pupils not only for the next stage of their education, but for lifelong learning. Many of you will have heard me say before that Key Stage 3 in general and Years 7 and 8 in particular are the last bastion of independence in the curriculum between uh, the tyranny of Key Stage 2 tests and often three-year courses leading to GCSEs. Whatever is going to happen to GCSEs in the coming years, CE will assist in developing pupils who enjoy reading and are able to articulate clearly, orally, and in writing. And then CE is based on a secure foundation of subject knowledge, concepts, and skills. So while we believe in the importance of examinations, of assessment, of subjects, and of knowledge, we want these to underpin understanding of wide ranging concepts and skills. This helps pupils understand how subjects connect with each other and to demonstrate cultural awareness and empathy, developing an understanding of their own place in the world. Thirdly, CE encourages pupils 
to apply what they know to new situations. Applying knowledge and developing skills are essential to growing in confidence and flexibility as learners. Our consultation wanted to make explicit the expectation that pupils should have the confidence to weigh up evidence and make up their own minds and the resilience to learn from their mistakes. And finally, CE develops enthusiastic learners who are open to new ideas and experiences, who are curious, questioning, and keen to experiment. The teachers we spoke to were proud subject specialists whose motivation was to nurture enthusiasm and open-mindedness. Our specifications should encourage pupils to have the skills to work independently and collaboratively. So in this way, CE is about more than the assessment at the end. In getting to the point where a pupil can perform at their best in these examinations, they will develop as learners and thus will CE acknowledge what they have achieved and what they know, understand and can do. But we felt something was missing, something which would allow pupils to apply all this to an area of knowledge not defined by any specification, but generated by their own interests. This is what motivated us to develop an age appropriate version of the extended project qualification, which we have come to call the ISEB project qualification or IPQ. We see this as a real opportunity for exciting learning through real research. The IPQ can be undertaken in subject timetabled or homework time or in off table timetable time, like after examinations in the summer term of year seven or after CE itself, uh, or of course, as a co curricular activity. It allows pupils to ask a question that interests them, to research the answer, to amend the question in the light of the research to reach conclusions and to present those in whatever form they wish, be it a, an essay, an artifact, a podcast, a PowerPoint presentation, a performance or whatever. Crucially, it's the entire process which is assessed and the output is only one part of that. So we think that CE plus IPQ make for an exciting and fulfilling learning experience for pupils and allow for exciting and fulfilling teaching. I think that's probably quite enough about the origins and the thought processes behind it all, the why, the whence and the wherefore. Uh, but it's with great pleasure that I hand over now to our new CEO, Julia Martin, to say more about the how how the specifications will bring all of this to life. Julia, thank you. Thanks, Darrell, and hello, everybody. Thank you very much for being here. Um, as Britain's oldest school exam, it dates back to about 1904, CE has really become an established rite of passage for generations. And actually, both Darrell and I remember ours well, and my own children are currently experiencing that heady balance of nerves, with that later a feeling of massive achievement about the next stage of their education in their lives. Transitions are really important milestone for young learners. And recognizing this, what we're aiming to do with the new CE specifications is balance heritage with that innovation. And the new specifications have been developed to underpin subject knowledge, which is what CE has been renowned for, with the development of really key academic skills. So the new specifications aim to support teaching and learning that makes an examination a natural culmination of two years, worth of two years worth of study. And it develops learners that can apply what they know to unfamiliar situations. And actually, 
have the assessment as part of their confidence in their ability and it ends one stage of their education with learners thoroughly equipped for what is to come next. Before I hand over to our subject expert, Simon, it's to let all of you know that later on we will be taking questions. They can be done through the chat. For those of you that would like to do that or are not seeing chat on your screens, you will have to log into YouTube or Google first, and then you will be able to see them. And you can do that while we're live streaming. Um, if you are unable to see the chat again, just make sure your window is minimized when the time comes and you can type simply into YouTube. I'll see them here and I'll make sure that we answer as many questions as possible. But as I said, common entrance CE is best expressed by our experts. So I'm hugely grateful to our subject expert in geography, Simon Lewis, who is going to tell you all about his development of the specification. Julia, thanks very much indeed. And uh, welcome everybody this afternoon. Such a shame we can't meet in person, but um, I hope you enjoy uh, what I have to say this afternoon. And uh, I'm gonna start with a little run through just to remind you in comparison to the new specification with uh, the old one, what's, what's actually changed. So uh, first of all, an overview of the new specification. Um, you've probably all seen it by now and hopefully have downloaded it and are already thinking about how you're going to um, implement things next term. So the main changes are these. Um, obviously, it's no longer called a, a, a syllabus. Uh, they're all called now specifications. And it's, as Darrell said, the emphasis is very much on acquiring transferable skills uh, we're moving away from memorizing facts. Obviously, you need knowledge and skills, and they go together like a horse and carriage, but it's the transferable skills which are really the most important. What we're trying to achieve by students doing the common entrance is that they are fully equipped to cope when they get to senior school. They have those skills in place and that they can springboard off and tackle um, the demands of GCSE. Um, so think of it really as a conveyor belt and we're the, the starting point moving these pupils forward and inspiring them. Um, so what's also new in the specification is we are requiring uh, you to use GIS and that might sound a bit scary to some of you, but really if you work with the Ordnance Survey Digimap for Schools, which I know most of you are using, that's really as far as we need to go on the GIS. Um, but that is a super tool which you can use throughout your geography teaching. And as I say, it's an example of one of those transferable skills that is going to be built upon when I get to uh, senior school. Um, so no longer a need for rote learn case studies, which I'm sure comes as a great relief uh, to you all. Um, of course, using examples and case studies is something we all want you to continue doing because that's what turns the theory uh, into the real world. And you, you, you really make your points by using examples and case studies. But what we don't want is children having to trot out their, their learned case studies under exam conditions. And what will happen in practice is that probably the more able candidates will, will drop in examples or refer to things that they've studied. But the questions themselves won't ask uh, the candidate to to uh, specifically recall a particular case study. Uh, so um, the other huge change, which I'm particularly proud of, is the emphasis on the environment. And I think if it was not for the, the pandemic, which I think could be traced to uh, the environment anyway, I think this would um, you know, be dominating uh, even more than it is. But it's absolutely crucial that in this century we we really acquaint the pupils with the importance of looking after our planet Earth. And so environmental protection, um, a sustainability, stewardship as well. And that all features very heavily in this new specification. And I think it's it's so important that geography is seen as the go-to subject really in the school regarding the environment. And I've designed this section with a view to building in 
the connection that many of you schools, uh, your schools have uh, with environmental um, clubs and uh, seeking green status of various kinds. So that first-hand experience of school projects or local projects that can be fed in to uh, you know them answering some of the questions that will be set on this environment topic. So I'll speak a little bit more about that later. And uh, industry is now broadened out. So instead of a preoccupation with manufacturing, secondary industry as there is with the current syllabus, uh, it'll be um, considering more widely all sectors of economic activity. Uh, you know, the truth is that um, up to 80% of, of uh, people working now are in the tertiary sector uh, in the UK. Um, so we need to reflect that in the questions that we're asking. So manufacturing is still there, but also an awareness of other um, means of earning a living and the sectors that they represent. Um, but we have taken out just to balancing some of the intricacies of manufacturing. And then finally, the location knowledge list, which I think is important to retain. It has been trimmed slightly and also updated. And we've made the concession that you don't have to learn some of the capital cities of uh, you know in the rest of the world section. So those are the main changes. And these are the things which have been reduced because I think there was a need just to look again at what we we're asking you to cover. And so to make way for the environmental section, we have taken out quite a lot of what you might have been used to if you've been teaching the C syllabus for a, a number of years. Um, so uh, weathering, for example, is, is going. Not that I wanted to take weathering out, but again, we had to make space for the new stuff coming in. It was going to be unfair to, to ask you to do more in sometimes limited contact time. So weathering has to go. Um, and also the precise pr processes of erosion. So erosion needs to be understood. And certainly um, the more able candidates will still you know, almost inadvertently refer to hydraulic action or corrosion, corrosion, uh, abrasion, attrition, all those things which uh, I'm sure you're used to teaching. So you can cover those, but we're not going to ask the candidates to define these. The reason being is pure GCSE, really, and uh, the real intricacies can be dealt with later. Um, obviously, it is very important that they understand how erosion uh, is shaping the Earth's surface. They have to understand how material gets transported. And finally, they need to understand that uh, material gets deposited and that new landforms can, can be created as a result. So it's just not going into so much detail. That's the change. As mentioned, no specific case study to be required, um, but feel free to um, illustrate your points with as up-to-date examples as possible, I think is good practice. Um, uh, obviously, they remain at the discretion of, of you as a teacher. And if you're using any of the new um, textbooks, either John Wooderson's book, which is coming out um, shortly in June, or there's the Belinda Froud uh, Yannick revision guide, which is being revamped. Uh, there's uh, new case studies in those which you can use, or you're very welcome to use your own. Okay. Um, there's also no longer a requirement to learn specific diagrams. Um, but again, you know, often a, a, a well annotated diagram can be a great way of explaining a process and can possibly save a lot of time in exams. So although you feel free to still teach those and to encourage pupils to use them, uh, there's not going to be a question in the exam which asks you to, to replicate a particular diagram. Um, you might though be asked to label and annotate diagrams as happens um, currently um, so um, but that should be not not really a change of, of any substance and as i said before you don't have to know the intricacies of manufacturing processes so all that inputs work done and outputs goes um, so that's that's the reductions there and these are things which remain un unchanged so field work very much the jewel in the crown and we certainly uh, want the children to reconnect with the environment and to have that experience of, of um, uh, gathering primary data 
And I know it's been tricky, uh, both this last year and possibly the year before, but uh, we want this to resume as soon as possible if you've been unable to, to, to um, do this this year. Um, because it is a very, very important experience and certainly senior schools value it, um, particularly if the candidates carry on to choose geography at, at A level. Uh, location knowledge, that remains largely un unchanged. As I said, there's a slight reduction uh, to that list. Just, just don't have to know all the, the capital cities of the minor countries. Uh, the Ordnance Survey map reading remains, and again, we will be setting questions on 1 to 50,000 scale maps and 1 to 25,000 scale maps uh, for anywhere in Britain. Um, and we think that's still a vital geographic skill, that even if you're not using an Ordnance Survey map, that ability to, to map read is really key. And although um, certain labs are fantastic, uh, they just don't. They don't um, you know, give you the answers to the landscape that you're passing through and all the, the other features of enjoying the countryside. You have to be able to map read to be able to, to get out there and uh, use these footpaths and explore national parks and all the coasts. Uh, so so that, that's, we think, is still very, very important. And also, we're not changing the length and overall structure of the written exam. Uh, uh, there's just a slight change in the thematic studies content, which I'll, I'll explain later. Um, but um, it's still that one hour exam and you do everything as well. Um, we're still going to have a mix of short and more in-depth questions. And these are the, the, the longer questions are your differentiators. Uh, we didn't want to go to having to have different levels in geography. We just think that's not necessary if you can construct a, a really good exam paper but uh, hopefully it should be accessible for um, the less able and they can still do uh, relatively well but also stretch the more able and give give your able candidates a chance to show what they they know and so what do we want the pupils to be able to do uh, this is it in essence uh, think geographically OK, always have that in the back of your mind. Um, with the prep school curriculum, um, it's always important to remember why these separate subjects exist. And my strong feeling is that we all bring something extra to the party. And there are some really key geographic skills which don't necessarily get um, spotted or tested in literacy and numeracy. And I think we all had that, that um, situation where pupils who might not be thriving in those core subjects, they suddenly find something that they ha do have a natural aptitude for. And they can have a, a spatial awareness. They can think geographically. They are aware of the interaction of um, uh, processes and features in the world and how they, they uh, integrate. And so all of this is thinking geographically, and this is the, the best thing that you can hand them on uh, to their senior schools with, um, something that becomes innate, uh, almost a sort of mo modus operandi uh, for them. Um, location knowledge. Sometimes people ask me, well, why do you retain this? Because you can just look up these places in the atlas or on the internet now. You know, do you really need to know where these places are? Well, I think it is very, very important, particularly in this information knowledge, if you're tuning into the news now, listening on the radio or the television news, I think being able to visualize how places relate to each other, where they're located, um, is absolutely crucial to that fuller understanding. So it's all about building a mental map, really. And it's also something that the children can enjoy learning, especially if it's in a quiz format. And it will help them in later life. I think it's one of those building blocks that is so crucial to having a full understanding of geography. If you like, it's, it's the kind of nuts and bolts. It's the, it's the uh, you know, the grammar of the subject, if you like. And I think it's always disappointing if you encounter a geographer and they don't really have that mental map of the world. They can't tell you where places are. I think we need to make sure that, that geographers can do that. I think it's expected. Um, 
the ordnance survey map reading yes it's really that ability to pick up a map perhaps of an area you've never been to before and be able to interpret that landscape i think that's a really useful thing not just um, in terms of planning a holiday but just being able to um, describe the landscape explain the landscape purely from the map without any first-hand knowledge necessarily obviously it helps if you've been there but it's there's so much you can glean from a good ordnance survey map so that's again a skill which we want them to acquire and take take with them in into later life um so physical geography we want them to understand the physical processes that shape our earth and to recognize the landforms created by them uh, with the human geography, they've got to understand the human processes and economic development. And then they also need to appreciate how human landscapes are created in response to the physical landscape. So things like the location of settlements, for example, you know, it's not a random decision. Um, early settlers in particular were looking for key features where, you know, it might just be the location of a water supply or a bridging point. These are all natural features and we respond to our natural environment. So it's appreciating that connection between the human and the, uh, the natural landscape. And then in the environmental geography, we want the children to, yes, appreciate the need for stewardship, taking care of the world, and also, and it's an overused phrase, but yes, sustainable development, you know, activities that can carry on, be it using renewable energy sources, um, but can carry on indefinitely without damaging both uh, the environment now, but for future generations. And I think it's such an important requirement, I think, for us to get this message over. Um, you know, these are going to be eco ambassadors of the future. And I think we've got a, a part to play in, uh, in uh, you know, sending them out with a real understanding as to, you know, the threats there are to the, the world at the moment. And as I said, field work, yeah, we want the inquiry-based learning to um, continue. And uh, if you're a fan of John Widdison's um, style, his textbook, that's also an inquiry-based approach, getting the children to, to um, pose questions uh, themselves and then go out and find the answers. Um, so that's what we want the, the, the pupils to do. So just a quick reminder about the, the time scale. Um, obviously, the, the new specification is out there and it's first teaching from um, this September. But in advance of that, we've got uh, new textbooks uh, coming out. Now, the first, as I said, is the John Woodison uh, Geography for CE. That's due to be published in June. Uh, Belinda Fraudianik's revision book is coming out, I think, next year because it's not quite so urgent. But certainly take a look. I think um, Julia's going to say something about uh, Glore Park publications a bit later. Uh, but certainly, uh, I think you'll be impressed with the new main textbook. And I've been involved as uh, editor on that, and it certainly fits the new specification very well indeed. And so first teaching, as I said, September of this year. And that means your first CE exam will be November 2022. November 2022. So uh, that will be the practice one. That's the autumn paper. And if you're preparing uh, scholarship candidates and they, the school is using the case paper, It'll be February 2023. And then finally, the, the, the important date really is June 2023, uh, which is when most of you uh, have candidates doing the CE exam. So that's the time scale. And so I'm just going to pause the moment. At that moment. And then I'll move on to uh, talk a little bit about, uh, about the exam. Okay. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, I have a couple of questions. Yes. Um, so perhaps if, if we cover those now. Um, so 
The first one, bear with me. Um, will I need to change my geography schemes of work significantly to do the new specification justice? Okay. I don't I don't think so. I mean, I think what we've done with the current um, syllabus is it's been streamlined, it's been slimmed down. Um, the environmental element now stands with its own heading, whereas before there was still the environmental there to a large extent, but it was more embedded. So if you did transport and industry, the population would settle. That would, that would be you know, with a view of the environmental aspect as well. So, um, so I don't think that there, there needs to be a major change. Um, we don't set out your own programme of study. I think that's important to emphasise. You know, what we are setting out with the specification is that, um, you know, this is what we are going to set questions on. How you arrange your programme study is up to you. I'm personally, and uh, I don't know how many of you do this, you know, I start my CE preparation with candidates far earlier than year seven and eight. So I always have it in the back of my mind with years five and six. And certainly some aspects of the physical geography are relatively simple enough to, to um, cover with year five pupils even. And I think if you do that, if you think of a sort of spiral uh, curriculum, um, you can put these these sort of initial um, uh, understanding in place at a, an early age, even if you're picking up on it when they're a bit older. Okay, Julia. Thank you, Simon. I just have one more question and then I will let you uh, carry on talking um, about the exam in some more detail. The second one was, could I use inquiry-based teaching to integrate issues like sustainability and climate change? Uh, was that could I or? Could I, yes. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Definitely um, looking in, into that. Um, I think we'll need a separate um, presentation on field work if if that's at the back of their mind. But certainly, yes, they can. They sustainability, I would suggest, is where they ought to start with because that's something you can do at any scale. So local is uh, obviously a good starting point. I think the climate change is obviously, you know, a much bigger issue. Doesn't lend itself quite so well to uh, the collection of primary data, uh, but you could do your own investigation as to what's happening uh, temperature-wise, or you know whether the environment local to the school is being affected. You can certainly um, formulate some questions that you could then uh, try and answer through field work. Yeah. Thank you very much, Simon. So I know you were going to talk a little bit more about the exam, so I will let you do that, and then we can come back. If any of the audience have any questions at the end as well, do put those on the chat. So, Simon, I shall let you carry on. Thank you, Julia. Okay. Okay. Right, so I'm going to talk now about the, the written exam. And it's still, as I said before, one hour in length, and there's still a requirement to answer all the questions. Um, and I think that makes life a lot easier than uh, dividing your paper into sections. And as happens with some subjects, that you have to make sure that people know which sections to answer. You haven't got that extra complication. Um, which hopefully will help exam preparation. Uh, so you're going to have your location knowledge section as the, the starting point. And these really are um, easy marks to acquire, provided you know they've been um, properly primed. Um, and as I say, the, the, the point of it is to build that mental map. So I think it's very good that, that we still have this uh, requirement and as I said before the children will actually really enjoy it if it's um, delivered in the classroom in a quiz format uh, there's also some very good online programs even apps now that can test your location knowledge 
and uh, they can compete amongst themselves for the highest score. So I think the preparation can be easily slotted in, even if the, the location knowledge list looks a bit onerous. Um, and just a reminder that within that list, uh, you have um, places in italics, and that is to um, match the national curriculum requirement that um, pupils know these particular places by the end of key stage two. So if you're not teaching years five and six, for example, you could give uh, that list of uh, places for those teachers to cover in their geography lessons so that all you have to worry about is the, is the extra places on top. Uh, which we've deemed uh, should be covered in year seven and eight. Um, so the map reading, that will still uh, have between 10 and 15 marks. Uh, so that stays. And then the slight change is this. We've now got six thematic studies. So what we've, what we've done is we've added to the, um, the five that we have at the moment within environment section but we can still divide them in two ways into what we call mainly physical geography questions and uh, so these will cover the first three topics earthquakes and volcanoes tectonic weather and climate meteorology rivers and coasts geomorphology so absolutely no change there but instead of having a question on every element we're just going to set two questions. And the reason for that is to enable setters to weave um, things together. So um, it's good to identify the different sections of geography, but you don't want them to be seen as standalone independent topics. You know, at the end of the day, the real world is completely integrated, as you know. And so we are going to set questions which might, for example, um, you know, go from weather and climate. Um, an example might be we've had record rainfall this winter and then move into rivers and coasts where we traditionally look at the flooding elements as well. So what you'll find is it's covering, it's testing the same areas as before, but there's a little bit more of a holistic approach. Um, so that's that's section C, that's physical. And then section D is your more human geography topics and with the environmental as well. So again, there'll be two questions set rather than three. So we, we had to do this because in an hour exam, there just wouldn't be time to set an individual question on every element. OK, so um, sometimes it will be one question which goes into two areas or sometimes you might find that you know, there isn't something on transport that particular year. OK, uh, not 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 in the whole year, I might add, just that particular paper uh, we're talking about. So over the year, you would get a question on everything. But in a particular exam, there might only be, um, you know, two out of three things um, tackled. Yeah, you know, sometimes we will cover all three, but it's not guaranteed because we're only setting two questions again. And you'll notice that the marks will range from 25 to 30 marks. So we're keeping with the total of having 80 marks in all, plus the 20 that are provided by the fieldwork inquiry. So not a great deal of change there. Um, as I say, you've got the new topic, uh, the stewardship and sustainability, the environment topic. Uh, just tacked into that section D there. Okay, and a little bit more on uh, these two new sections. Um, so um, when 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 I say physical geography, yes, they will focus on the net processes and landforms as a starting point. So we're talking the the mechanics of of the landscape, um, but it's not to preclude a connection with um human elements as well so um yes as i said uh, questions may require an understanding of more than one element of tectonic meteorological and geomorphological processes and then just like questions do currently although you might have to explain uh an erupting volcano or the um origins of an earthquake 
um, the questions we'll go on to look at what is the you know the human impact and response of that so although it's within the physical geography section it will spin out um, to link with the human world um, as as it has traditionally done um, and obviously there's not the requirement to rope learn case studies but i would certainly encourage you to use um, uh, examples and particularly breaking news examples um, i've got a couple that i could share with you towards the end if there's time but i'll i'll leave those for now um, but that's that's the physical section that's section c and then section d it's the other way around so the question will focus on the human and environmental issues and processes um, and certainly they will sometimes stray into a couple of um, what we call topic areas they won't necessarily be confined to one so obviously uh, we'll be able to take advantage of the the link of transport and economic activities but also bringing the environmental as well that could all be within one question um, uh, but just as with the physical, you need to realize the link with the human world here, you need to sometimes understand that it's the physical geographic fa factors that affect the human response and development. So, you know, things like bad weather affecting, um, you know, flying, for example, you know, uh, not to divorce the human world from the physical. So, Again, not necessary to learn um, particular case studies, but I would I would certainly encourage you to use examples and case studies in your teaching. Okay, so just um, finally, before I take some more questions, what does this mean for your teaching? Well, I would have these things at the back of your mind. Um, firstly, as I say, uh, it's your certainly your year seven pupils from this September that you need to start teaching. Uh, if you can do it with, if you want to start earlier, you could you could change things with your, your year six pupils as well. But certainly the year seven pupils will need need you to have made this switch to the new syllabus. Specification, sorry. Um, and definitely, yeah, focus on the acquisition of transferable skills. Okay, it's not it's not their knowledge, it's whether they they are able to do their map reading. Can they do investigative field work? Okay, that's that's what we we really uh, aim to do in in our teaching, and certainly develop curiosity in our world and get the children to ask questions, uh, just as a matter of course. And as said before, use an inquiry based approach to learning, and that's woven into John Widdison's book. And this is, I think, is very important as well. It's so often to um, a trap which you can fall into whereby you talk about things that have happened a few years ago and as you know the world changes very rapidly and before you know it if we're not careful we're we're coming over as history teachers rather than geography teachers so we're more concerned with the present and thinking about the future um, and although you can learn lots of lessons from the past um, you know that's the realm of the history teacher ultimately um, so, as I say, yeah, breaking news stories are particularly good. I mean, getting the children to to listen, you know, outside of school to to news reports, uh, you know, even if it's inadvertently, they're hearing something on the radio on the school run, uh, but linking that, oh yes, you know, suddenly you're the teacher who's talking about it in school. So do that as much as possible because it, it it's amazing the the natural enthusiasm which comes through by taking this approach. And as I said, do use GIS. If you're uncomfortable with that, I said um, use use Digimap for schools, and uh, um, that's a fantastic tool. So just just using that in your teaching, uh, including uh, fieldwork investigations, uh, that will be job done. Uh, also, there's fantastic facilities, you know, maps and graphs, uh, using data I gained from online. And it's all about identifying spatial patterns. And if you see the pattern, then you can start trying to come up with an explanation. Um, also, very important, think long-term. 
okay it's so easy especially when you're conscious of your results to get a bit preoccupied with the exam uh, remember what you're trying to do really is equip these um, pupils for lifelong learning and to be enthusiastic geographers and um, definitely pick it at GCSE is one of their options um, so you need to pack that rucksack for future study that's what it's about it's not so important to to crack the exam what's really important is that they've got all these tr transferable uh, skills to take with them they've got that rucksack and they're going to feel comfortable and self-confident when they get to their senior schools and definitely embrace outdoor learning and uh, I think if anything the, the pandemic has encouraged everybody to get outside more and more and it's so important that we we keep this connection with the real world and don't allow children to to operate divorced from the real world so it's all about connecting with your local environment and if you're lucky enough to be able to take them away for some residential field work um you know possibly take them to a national park if that's within reach and that would be a fantastic um experience seeing perhaps somewhere different to their, their local environment is also very useful because it can bring a you know more awareness of the real world and also it can it can make them appreciate their own uh, local environment a little bit more as well as seeing somewhere else and so yeah it's really aiming to nurture both a love of geography and a care for our world and uh, i think it's essential you know if we're going to stand any hope of uh, keeping the world a beautiful and um, uh, preserved uh, wonder, uh, we need to be doing our bit and uh, inspiring these children uh, to get out there and, and uh, really look after the world, not just for themselves, but for future generations. Okay, that's, that's it from me, other than fielding some more questions. So I hope that's been useful. Sorry, Simon, that was my fault. Um, what I was going to say is that you'd mentioned previously the rural park books, and so I was just going to talk about that a little bit because geography yeah. is actually the first one that is coming out that's related to this specification, and that will be in June. And that's uh, John Woodison, as you said. Um, for anybody that would like to learn more about the rural park, all of these books are available on their website but there's also an email down there which um we we will have these slides up so if you don't catch it now uh, it's candace thurston but if you don't catch that now um you will be able to go back and have a look um as ever if you have any questions at all about the presentation or you'd like to ask Simon or anybody at ISEB any questions, if you think of it after the event, you can either come back and re-watch this, because obviously, uh, why wouldn't you? But uh, you can also email us at ISEB on inquiries at iseb.co.uk. I'm seeing some questions um, come through, which is amazing. Um, yeah. So I will start to ask those now. Um, okay. But firstly, Simon, actually, there was something that you said, um, because yeah. obviously I'm I'm new to ISEB. So there was something you'd said that was really interesting. And I just wondered whether the inquiry-based learning, whether being able to do whole school projects on some of these really key issues in society at the moment, and actually mm. really global issues, they don't just affect us in mm. the UK. But do you think um, that the specification encourages a shift in the way that we can teach and the way that we can influence young people? Yeah, I would say so, really. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've emphasised the importance of field work. Well, that can be carried out, you know, at, at all times, really. If you can get them outside, get them looking into things firsthand. I think that's a marvellous way of learning. I mean, I do lots of things in the school grounds. Um, you know, you can, you, you can do a survey of litter, for example, as well as... Uh, encouraging the children to um, clear things up. Uh, you can you can check out um, impacts of uh, climate change in terms of the way um, uh, plants are uh, reacting. We've had a very unusual 
spring and it's been so dry and cold you know whether that's to do with the wider changes you could discuss you get the children discussing these things also to monitor what's happening to the environment in terms of you know new buildings the landscape is changing around them and yes i would say to you yeah definitely i think the new specification gives a an extra uh incentive to do inquiry-based learning definitely Okay, thank you. We had another question, which was about the case paper. Uh, somebody wanted to know if the case, the Common Academic Scholarship paper, has changed as well, or whether you're looking at that. No, um, what we've decided is that the case paper should stay at it, as it is, um, mainly because it's been very good. It's got the two sections. The first section A is data response, and you've got a choice of one out of two. And then section B, you do one bit of six, and then you have questions posed on the whole specification. So uh, what's nice about doing the case is that it is possible to teach a combined CE and scholarship group because the subject matter is the same, just the difference is the way it's being examined. So it's exactly the same topics and the way they integrate it into each other. And I hope you'll be pleased that the, the, the scholarship exam is really staying on there. That's great. Thank you. I have another one. Um, have you got any tips on preparing children to answer unfamiliar questions on topics they know? <laughs> mm. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. I think it's always important to look at past papers. We try very hard to make sure that the questions are accessible as possible um, to the extent we we don't we don't have over wordy questions it's there's an art in making the question as clear as possible using the, the least number of have words to be uh, you know to make it make it absolutely um, precise for the, the student and they don't misinterpret things um, so I would certainly recommend looking at past papers i say past papers because although they're based on the current um uh specification syllabus you know this is a direction we've been moving in before so if you've been using the ce papers up until now you've probably witnessed already a slight um shift um, in the style of those questions and that will be the style that continues uh with the setting of questions on the first uh, on the new specification uh, and you know the second team and myself we've already been setting uh, the first papers um, because we operate a number of years ahead um, we've already started setting those questions and I can tell you that the, the style of those questions is not going to uh, change significantly from what you've been used to thank you um could you remind us of the subjects that are no longer being tested Oh, yes, we're not going to be looking at weathering, okay, weathering goes. We're not going to be looking at the intricacies of uh, manufacturing. Uh, you don't have to know the capital cities of some of the rest of the world countries. Or you'll just need to check the, the up-to-date um, uh, location knowledge list there. And, um, so those are the main ones at the, at the top of my head. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Uh, now we have a question from the floor. Where, bear with me. Uh, is there any way, this is from Andrew Lee, is there any way that a knowledge of GIS will be examinable? Okay, yes, I did read that question from Andrew in the stream. Um, yeah, that is a tricky one. It is difficult to do um, when we've got paper exams. What I will say to Andrew is that we could be using uh, graphics from uh, Digimap possibly, and, and you, can take, you can take screenshots and you could insert those in the paper and then ask questions on those. Um, so it's a good question because unless you have online testing or some sort of interaction, that is a harder thing to examine. But um, certainly we'll be using uh, maps that 
will increasingly show, as we do already, in fact, we can have data superimposed on a world map or a map of the UK. So in, a, in, in essence, that's, that's a form of GIS. Um, but yes, you are slightly limited as to how you can examine that within that one hour. Oh. Thank you, Simon. Um, so there was a question from Sarah and Nat, um, mm -hmm. which is, that, do you suggest so that many, I, I understand this one actually, many schools like to collect data about the mm -hmm. children as they're going along and um, yeah. we're being asked, as a school which likes data points regularly, have you got suggestions for doing unit tests which blend questions and cross topics? Mm, okay. Um, I think I'd need a bit more time to reflect on that, Julia. But I, I certainly, um, I, I think what she, he and she was getting at is, is yeah, having a, a neat sort of um, half term or end of term test. Um, that could be used to monitor the, the progress of candidates. I mean, that's something that I myself do, and it is useful. Um, and certainly, there is, yeah, we could we could certainly look at developing some 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 uh, topic tests if that's required um, as a as a helpful uh, resource in the classroom. Um, so, otherwise, it's up to the individual teachers in Julia to design their own based on that term's work. Um, but um, certainly we could look at that if there was, there was, there was um, demand for that, those kind of topic tests. Great, thank you. Uh, now there's one that is uh, flummoxing, <laughs> flummoxing me, but I shall read this one to you, it's brilliant. Uh, how much of the terminology in the environment will be required, e.g. AOMB, SSFI, yeah. Particulate yeah. matter, zero carbon, defining global global warming, and greenhouse gases. Well done, Laura, for getting that one on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, that's a good question because if you're looking at the environment, yes, it's almost a bottomless pit, really, as to how much detail you could go into. I think your best guide is to look at the glossary uh, that, again, has been looked at carefully, um, and to look at the words to do with the environment in the glossary. That gives you some idea of the depth we require. I think the other guide will be both John Widdison's textbook and also um, Belinda Fraudianek's uh, revision book. Again, that will give guidance as to the depth that you need to go into. And some of these acronyms, yeah, can get a bit complicated. Um, as a rule, I like to avoid those, but certainly AONB. You could put alongside national parks in terms of uh, places that you could you could um, study uh, as a as a as an example, uh, possibly a local example or, or further afield. Um, but I think yes, I can probably give more guidance on that uh, for Andrew in particular if he's asking that. Uh, but I think also as the example has come on stream, you'll again get a a better idea as to the, the depth required there. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, there's a very good question from James Figgis, who is mm -hmm. asking, with the new environmental topic having the potential to be broad, will there yeah. be further detail shared of the content that should be covered beyond what is noted in the specs? Yeah, I think that's fair enough. I think because it is a new topic, I would certainly, um, James, like to do some follow-up presentations on that and um, be able to give you a better idea as uh, to things to include. Just to um, explain, the environment topic is just at three levels. So the first one is, is local, what's going on on your doorstep, um, particularly with a view to uh, doing some field work on that theme. Then national, which I would I would um, um, say is, is to focus on national parks or AONBs if you've got a local one to you. Um, that's the focus there. And then finally, you're dealing with the big global issues, you know, the plastic pollution, the global warming. So there's those three scales of looking at things. And I think to um, make 
make um, it a little bit easier to cover the, the you know some of the local stuff could be doing, being done as projects within the school um, particularly if you're chasing an eco status i know a lot of you like ourselves do the eco schools well certainly you know, we will have a lot of prior knowledge of what's going on at a local level without you necessarily having to do geography lessons and that but it's nice not to preclude them from using that knowledge and understanding in answer to questions in their geography paper. Thank you, Simon. Um, we have a question about how well we feel that CE prepares uh, pupils for GCSE. So do we feel that CE is a really good milestone to that? Yeah, um, certainly there's an excellent correlation between success at CE and how well they go on to do at GCSE. Um, the main thing is to ensure that they have these transferable skills. The CE syllabus is designed to dovetail into uh, the requirements of senior school uh, teachers and heads of geography there. Um, so I consult very widely with schools like Charlotte House and uh, Harrow and uh, others up and down the country as to what they think they need. And it's less knowledge and more uh, the nitty gritty skills so the field work and recording, an understanding of GIS, uh, an appreciation of the systems in the world and how they interrelate. Uh, so that's what we're doing. And I think the new specification uh, does that better than ever. So um, certainly it takes the pressure off candidates at GCSE if they have done common entrance geography for sure. Thank you. Um, I'm just having a quick look at the chat to see if there's anything we've missed. I don't think so. Um, there was one more that I had here that, that came in before the session, which is, do senior schools value CE, particularly in subjects like geography? And do yeah. they value that beyond just the entrance examination? Um, yeah. Do we feel it prepares students for secondary schools? Yeah. I think what we've seen recently, um, which has been uh, made worse by the pand pandemic, <laughs> is um, that some schools are saying, no, you don't have to use the E, uh, you know, we'll, we'll sort of waive that this year because of all the, the chaos. Um, but if you speak to the geography, they are very keen that students have followed the common entrance um, specification. They know how good it is. They know how well it prepares them for senior school, even if um, uh, schools say well, it's not needed. I know a lot of schools who have stopped doing the CE exam, but the heads of geography are still using the, the, the CE specification because it really has all the nitty gritty there. And uh, that forms their basis of a programme of study even though they might not be doing the CE exam. So it's still very, very useful. And uh, as I say, I'm in contact with a lot of senior schools uh, and they are yeah, more than happy that this is excellent preparation for what they uh, go on to do. Well, thank you very much, Simon. I cannot see any more questions online and we've exhausted those that came in. So I yeah. really want to thank you um, for taking the time. Um, it's the, you know, the work that's been done on the specifications is brilliant. And again, new to ISCB, it's really exciting um, to see what's happening. I actually have a last minute question. Look at this, uh, from Richard Parsons, who mm -hmm. says, can the specification be covered in 65 minutes lesson time a week and a prep every three weeks? Okay, yeah, now that's a good point. I think whenever I've been asked this question, you want to aim for, with your director's studies, you need to have an hour, uh, hour and a half of um, uh, teaching time, contact time, uh, ideally plus a half hour prep is what I would say is the ideal. Now, if you're getting less than that, then there's a good argument to go back and negotiate more contact time because, yeah, that's going to be difficult. The other way around it, of course, is to start your uh, preparation uh, at a younger age. So I've already said some things that you could be covering years five and six. Um, I want to move people away from just thinking, this is my programme study for years seven and eight. Um, it shouldn't be viewed like that. It's basically 
telling you what needs to be known so that they can do well in the exam. We're covering that in two years it will be a struggle for anybody. So you need to look at how it can be tackled um, at a young age, and that will make things less pressured and uh, more enjoyable. And it will also build, build that foundation more strongly, I would suggest, rather than trying to, to rush through uh, everything. Fabulous. Thank you, Simon. And thank you, everybody, for asking questions. There are a couple of bits I just wanted to bring in at the end, is that we, the uh, video for this, as I said, will we'll go live on the YouTube channel soon, but we will also put it up on the ISEB website, and that will be under examinations and assessments. On that page, we also have a short survey. It's being done by us and the publisher, Galore Park, because we'd really love to know what kind of additional resources and information as teachers and as schools that you would really value. So do let us know. As I say, any questions, um, issues that you would like addressed, if there are, um, if you're needing any additional copies of the specification, again, inquiries at iscb.co.uk. One of the things that we just wanted to remind teachers is obviously as the specifications are new, do make sure that you're regularly checking those specifications. Now, we're not intending to change things drastically at all, but every now and then there are addenda. So do make sure that as you're teaching, you're just keeping up to date with the specification. There's also a great glossary at the back of that as well that should be really useful, and it helps make it a really good working document. But as I say, we're always really eager to hear what you think, uh, what you like, what you don't like. So please do get in touch. And again, a huge thank you to Simon. Thank you to Darrell for introducing everything at the beginning as well. And um, we shall say a goodbye. Thank you so much for tuning in. And Thanks. like I say, stay in touch. Thank you, Simon. Thanks, Julian. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.